quite I think first of all it, it needs clarity because I have been reading the papers today now obviously I live in another part of the country where um, this is not our school system we we had our complete and utter shambles uh, about a fortnight ago uh, and uh, had had to find a way out of that um, but really the, the education secretary needs to grip this because as, as far as, as of what I've read this morning um, you know they came out early they tried to reassure students and pupils before they got the results which is something that didn't happen in Scotland and something that was very welcome they said look here's all of the ways in which if this doesn't live up to your expectations uh, you can you can look to appeal whether that's on the projected grades from your teacher whether that's on uh, your mock exam results or whether that's the ultimate of being able to actually go and sit your exams in the autumn um, and now suddenly you've got off call running around saying well actually some of the ways in which we said that you could appeal you now can't like this needs gripped this is not just um, one of these bubble issues. This is something that cuts through everything. And MPs should be telling the Chief Whip, including Conservative MPs, that this will absolutely be one of the things that even people that don't even pay attention to, to politics will be all over because this is their child's future. Uh, and, you know, you've seen the reaction there. We've got the GCSEs coming in next week. So that's another cohort of, of pupils that could be in the same boat. And uh, and, you know, <laughs> the education secretary needs to get out on the television. He needs to be telling people what's going on. He needs to be putting, telling off call what is going to happen. And he needs to grip this. And you're right in the sense that it's really a, a sense of fairness and what's fair and what's not. And that grips people, as you say, it doesn't matter whether or not their children are involved in this, this crisis or not. It's just sitting back watching something that just seems so unjust. Well, exactly. And I mean, the issue in, in Scotland, and I think, you know, I I haven't compared the algorithms between Scotland and England, but it, it looks as if they're broadly similar, or at least have key touch points that are the same. But you get to the point where there were children who had absolutely worked their hardest, bright kids, but in schools from, you know, poorer areas who literally could not have succeeded. There was no way in which, even had they answered every single question correct, they could have succeeded uh, in every piece of module that they'd worked and every mock exam that they'd sat because the computer would have said no. And that is against absolutely every sense of natural fairness that we have. Uh, and it's also a, a, against everything that we've been taught of, you know, how you can, uh, you know, I don't know whether you say, we, I think we call it social mobility, but it's like, how do you make sure that you have a better education uh, or, or a, a better life chances for your children. You tell them to dig in and work hard at school because if they work hard and do the right thing, you know, they will be rewarded for that. Well, actually, there's kids out there who have worked hard, who have done the right thing. And now, you know, basically, fate has dropped on them from a from a great height. And, and you know, nobody could see a pandemic coming. Everybody knows that it's impossible to hand out exam results for exams that were never sat. It was never possible to sit the exams because of COVID. But surely there must have been a better way than this. And of course, we've got GCSE results coming out later on this week. Mm. Um, we are at risk of round two, the bell ringing, uh, route, round two happening and uh, finding ourselves in exactly the same boat again. Well, that's the thing. And, and, and also, it's not even that. So in Scotland, the issue, part of the issue was that actually the education secretary up here uh, had been given the, the headline results five days before the individual results were given to kids and could have seen the car crash coming, didn't see it, then dug in for a week to defend the, you know, to, to defend the process and the algorithm and the way in which it was managed in the system over defending the kids. And, and, and you know, that was the charge that he picked, you know, the bureaucracy over the children. Uh, and that's the same charge now that can be levelled at the UK government too. Uh, and, you know, to have the issue that happened in Scotland to see that, to be able to see the grades ahead of them coming out, to see that it was also going to be an issue in England, to, to have two bites at the cherry, if you like, because A-levels and, and GCSEs come out on different days, unlike in Scotland, where all the exam results sort of come out on the same day. You know, why was more not done? I mean, I, I thought that the Education Secretary had done well to move quickly, to put the triple lock out there before kids got the results to say to them, look, even if what drops through your door isn't what you're expecting, there are there's recourse here. But, uh, you know, to have off call suddenly take some of the uh, some of that away, to, to have confusion uh, reigning, to have a, an, a, an appeal system which may or may not give you your appeal result back in time for you to make arrangements about your chosen university. You know, that's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. 
And you've talked about the comparisons with Scotland. Looking wider, uh, if you look at someone like Nicola Sturgeon, whose poll ratings were going the wrong way before coronavirus hit, she's perceived to have had, in many respects, what, what some people could call a good, fo- good crisis, if you can call it that. Um, that has resurged uh, the push for nationalism in Scotland, support for the SNP. You've got quite a battle on your hands now, haven't you? Well, I think you've got to be really, really careful about um, the difference between good comms and good government. You know, Nicola Sturgeon has never been accused of, of you know, not talking a good game. Um, but I think we've got to be really careful about what's actually happened in Scotland. So, you know, one of the, you know, there's been a couple of, of really big scandals. The first of which was one of the first major outbreaks here was at a, a work conference in Edinburgh, which nobody found out about and nobody was told about. And contact tracing didn't occur in the right manner uh, right back at the beginning in kind of in, in kind of March. Um, which also some people from that conference then set off early clusters in other parts of the UK, like the northeast of England, uh, in Teesside, uh, Tyneside, sorry. And, uh, you know, we knew nothing about it until there was a BBC documentary about it because the Scottish government didn't tell us. The big, big scandal is care homes. So we've we've just found out today that not only, which we had found out previously, have people been discharged from hospitals where there was COVID without having had a COVID test into care homes which then developed COVID. Um, We had guidance from the Scottish Government that said if COVID is developed in your care home, um, you know, sending somebody with COVID to hospital is kind of your last resort, don't do it, Um, which meant that (laughs) that people were not being treated who had it, the most vulnerable. But we found out today that there were actually people who had had positive COVID tests in hospital that were then sent to care homes and, that, and that's just lambs to the slaughter so there are really big questions there there's also questions on the economic front there's a group of businesses in scotland that are taking the scottish government to court uh, because they didn't receive the same funding uh, that that got the businesses in in england got so the the grant that was available from the uk government for uh, you know um coffee shops and cafes and those kind of, of people it was you know you could get a certain amount uh, per coffee shop that you owned um, but in, in Scotland uh, the way devolution works that so the money for that came to Scotland uh, and the Scottish government said well actually you know if you've got six branches you get the same as somebody with one branch so you know they're they're taking UK government monies or schemes rebadging them but not passing on the cash so if you had six coffee shops in Carlisle you get six times the amount of money as somebody that's got a coffee shop in Edinburgh so so there's a court case going on about that so you know I, I think we should be really careful about the difference between getting a, a free hour standing at a lectern on the BBC every day uh, and talking a good game and actually delivering for, for people who are vulnerable, who are vulnerable to health issues, who are vulnerable to economic issues in this crisis. And I, and I think there's a lot more to be told uh, about the way in which Scotland has handled this. Of course, many of those things that you talked about, such as crisis in care homes and other places, uh, were mirrored uh, from the UK government as well. But on the issue of the union in particular, something that really does rile some of your Conservative colleagues, because they're passionate Conservative and unionists, that's that's the name of the political party they belong to. Um, those people are, you know, in secret, behind closed doors, almost saying that we've been caught napping on the issue in terms of, you know, while we've been concentrating on coronavirus and trying to solve some of those problems, both north and south of the border, we've ignored the fact that there's this kind of resurgence for the SNP and nationalism. That is a really, really difficult job to tackle. And every time Boris Johnson goes north of the border, he doesn't always get a friendly response. Look, I think there's, there's quite a lot to unpack in there and, and um, it would be glib to try and do it in, in a kind of 30 second answer. So please forgive me if I, if I do give a bit more. I mean, first of all, if you're talking about the polling, um, you know, we're uh, nine months out from an election in Scotland. Um, nine months before the last election in Scotland, the SNP were polling in some polls over 60 percent and it was going to be a whitewash and all the rest of it and actually what happened nine months later was uh, the majority that Alex Salmond had handed Nicola Sturgeon she promptly lost because of the advance of the Scottish Conservatives so I, I mean I would take a little bit of that with a pinch of salt but I, I do think um, that there is an issue on the grounds that nationalists um, you know put the cause of separation into everything that they do every single day uh, and they, f- they fight that cause every day uh, and actually because uh, 
people who believe in Scotland's place in the United Kingdom and believe in the United Kingdom sticking together um, also want to do all of these other things as well. That's not their driving motivation. Uh, you know, they kind of thought in 2014 that we'd answered that question uh, and then moved on. And actually, it's not about moving on. If you've got a, a opposition whose one overriding characteristic, who's the first th thing on every policy list that they have, uh, is, is to split up the country. Actually, you've got to build in keeping the country together into your, you know, economic policy, into your uh, cultural policy, into all of these other things as well. And we've got to get better at that. And we've got to tell and retell the story of these islands and, and talk about, you know, why it's important and it, yes there are there are really good economic issues and covid is a fantastic example i mean there's nearly a million people uh in scotland who uh whose wages are are being paid by the uk government right now whether that's through a furlough scheme whether that's through the self-employed scheme or whatever um which if you know we had a separate currency and didn't have a central bank and all the rest of it just simply couldn't happen uh, under the independence model that's being put forward by the smp um but but that's not good enough we actually have to have a, a closer look at some of the other ties that bind as well and be a bit better about that. Um, in terms of some of the other questions that uh, have been raised uh, regarding uh, independence, I mean, I, I don't actually think that between 2014 and now, the fundamentals um, for independence have got any stronger. Uh, in many ways, they've gotten weaker. Uh, and I don't think the fundamentals for the union have gotten weaker uh, and in many ways have gotten stronger. So it's again, it's about telling and, and retelling that story. So your new partnership with Douglas Ross has somewhat raised some eyebrows because he's the leader of the Scottish Tories, but unable to challenge Nicola Sturgeon directly. How is that going to work in practice? And did you need some persuading uh, to be asked to help out? <laughs> yeah, well, um, on the persuading part, uh, yes, I, I, you know, I had stepped back a year ago and um, you know, it was a big wrench. I love being leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, I, I gave it, a, 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 you know, I, I did the job as well as I could, um, as hard as I could for as long as I could. And, and, and jobs like political leadership, they're really attritional. You know, they take a lot out of you. Uh, and at the point at which I stood back, I was absolutely ready to go. And, you know, I'd, I'd done, I'd led us through seven national elections and two referendums in eight years. Like, and that's hard. That's hard politics. That's really hard going. And I, I was ready to go. Um, but I did not need to be encouraged to come back nearly half as much as my partner needed to be encouraged to let me come back. So um, so the party owns me for the next nine months and then she owns me for the, the next 10 years, I think, in, in terms of allowing me to do this. So, uh, so that's uh, something that we have to work out. But in terms of um, in terms of the partnership, well, look, it's going to work in the way it's worked for other parties. We're the third. We're not the first time this has happened. We're the third time it's happened. So the first time was Alex Salmond became uh, leader of the SNP um, way, way back in 2000. And, oh, what was it? Three or four. Uh, and he put a certain Nicola Sturgeon uh, in at first ministers to ask questions on his behalf because he was sitting in Westminster uh, and not Holyrood. And they had fewer MSPs than we have now. Uh, they had 27, we've got 31, uh, and they managed to form a government, uh, you know, by one seat, but that's all it sometimes takes, uh, in 2007, off the back of that, the next election. So, you know, there is precedent there. The Labour Party's done it with Jim Murphy uh, and Kezia Dugdale. And I think when you're looking for a leader of a party, uh, and if you're a, particularly if you're a party who believes in the United Kingdom and believes that you should be sending representatives to Westminster as well as to Holyrood, uh, then you take the best talent that you've got. And Douglas Ross is undoubtedly a talented politician who's got drive, he's got vision, he's got energy, he's ready to take the fight to the SNP. Uh, and at the moment, he needs somebody to stand up at, at First Minister's questions and take on Nicola Sturgeon. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to serve and, until he's back in Holyrood. And when you look forward and think about the, you know, your track record in politics and uh, congratulations on your peerage, by the way, which is, reflects that long service of political, uh, political service in, in many regards. Um, I looked at the, uh, watched the uh, first minister's questions in the week and saw that uh, to and fro with Nicola Sturgeon around uh, your peerage in itself and the easy pop that she had about democracy and things. Do you feel that you are slightly open to attack now because of that? Look, I mean, I I also agree that the reforms to the House of Lords, um, which sort of stopped at a halfway house, sh should have continued. Um, you've got to have people in the Lords that are happy to vote for uh, it to be a democratic chamber, or it never will be. Now, you can believe that is true, 
at the same time as you also believe that while a second chamber has a function, which is to scrutinise and, and uh, revise legislation, that that function shouldn't just be carried out by people who live within the N25 corridor. It shouldn't just be carried out by people who've only got um, experience of, of one political chamber. So, so yeah, absolutely. Of course, Nicola Sturgeon was going to have a pop at me. But in terms of the, the pop back, you know, it, it's a bit of a cheap shot to have a go at, at other parties who send their ex-leaders, like the Scottish Labour Party, like the Scottish Conservatives, like the Scottish Liberal Democrats, to continue their service, just in another parliament. But to not say a word of criticism about your own ex-party leader, uh, you know, Alex Salmond, who decided that it was a good idea to be on Russia today uh, and be the face uh, of Russian state propaganda. So, you know, I mean, I think in terms of shades of, of, of what's political cut and thrust, absolutely fine. She wants to have a pop, I'll have a pop back. Uh, we're both big girls, we've been doing this a lot of years. Um, but in terms of be, having something to contribute, I, I think I do. And I think it's important that when you're reviewing legislation, you've got people in there who've got experience from different legislatures uh, around the United Kingdom. Um, and like I say, I am absolutely committed uh, that when reform is mooted, that I'll, I'll vote for it. Because I do think that as a, a modern uh, democracy, the second chamber of the United Kingdom should be an elected chamber. Oh, and also you can't have it both ways. We can't moan that there are too many men in the House of Lords and then criticise when <laughs> more women are appointed there. Um, the more the better, uh, 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 is in my view. Um, moving on well, to... Well, look, I, I think, you know, I, th I actually, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think there's some really interesting voices in the Lords and, and uh, I think it's going to be really good for me to work alongside some people uh, with the experience that they have and, and actually one of the things that you might lose when it becomes democratic is some of the independent voices and the cross benchers and I think that'll be a huge shame and I don't underestimate um, what is brought to the chamber and the thought and the expertise that's brought to the chamber but I think that there is a way to reform it which allows political parties uh, and some collective grouping of independents to be elected to there um, where if we're if we're smart as a nation um, we can still have those voices in there. I have to um, ask you so quickly I, on that. Mm. If Boris Johnson asked you to serve in, in his cabinet, would you would you step up? <laughs> not at the moment, no, absolutely not. I, I have uh, a very small child, as said, uh, going down there as a, a backbencher. Yes, there will be some, some work to do on certain days. But if you're a minister, you're basically in London full time. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've never wanted to live in London. My home is Scotland. My family's in Scotland. That is never going to change. Uh, so, uh, you know, while the, while the wee ones at home, you know, this leaving Holyrood was never about the big job. Uh, it, it's leaving to take a step back, um, at least until my young son and hopefully if myself and my partner are, are able to have any more children um, in the near future uh, until they get to school. And then I'll make decisions about another big job. But But this isn't it. I've been really clear about that. And, and just finally, when we look at the recovery of the wider uh, economy uh, and we look at Scotland uh, and such income is based on things like tourism, you know, and my heart bleeds for the Edinburgh Festival and everybody that's been involved in that in, in many years up until now. Uh, how do you think we can get the country back on track through recovery? We've got the winter months coming up. Um, what's your view on what the government needs to do next? Well, I, I think we are learning more and more about this virus all the time. Um, you know, what we thought we knew even in February, March has turned out not to be the case now. So we need to find a way, uh, I believe, to, to live with it in many ways. Um, my understanding from talking to, to medical friends and colleagues is that a, a, a vaccine when it comes is probably unlikely to be a, a kind of one size fits all job it's probably going to be more in the, the level of a flu vaccine where you have to have it repeatedly so we have to find new ways to, to to live around this and new ways to work around this um and i think we have to put everything that we know uh, into um how we structure places like arts venues how we uh, work and operate in shops and, and how we suppress outbreaks um, but but that requires individuals to take responsibility for themselves as well. So it, it means real clarity of message from the government. It means coherence in terms of the restrictions and guidance that's put in place. It means making sure that we, as soon as we have a, a vaccine available, that it, that it is made, that it does work. And it's also about a little bit of foresight and forethought of how we structure, particularly public facing 
businesses uh, and cultural venues, etc., for the economy going forward. How do we make this work? And and I, I my worry is at the moment is that not just in this country but in every country, everybody's head is 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 sort of down in the trenches trying to get through this right now, and rightly so. The health implications, the immediate economic implications, but actually we need to have a couple of people scanning the horizon as well for what next. Uh, and you, you know if that's happening, absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm not seeing it happen though, and and that gives me pause for thought.